said, need a little help from a couple of guys. I think I made more copies this time. I'm passing out what we need for tonight. I'll just let y'all divide those up and pass them out. If you don't have the first one or the second one, there's some more copies of all of those up here after the service tonight. You can come by and pick that up. But I want to start right where we left off. You know, we've had three messages, and after the third message tonight, we will have covered eight verses in the, in the book of Revelation. So it takes a lot of information to get through here. And I think I've got 20, if I'm not mistaken, I have 26 messages scheduled for this. We're going to stay on those. I do want to say this, that <laughs> next Sunday night... We won't have a message on the book of Revelation because next Sunday night is the praise fest. So we'd love to have you come and sing, those of you who sing and, and worship through a reading and that kind of thing. So we'll pick back up the first Sunday in August. We'll pick back up uh, right after that. Um, the, if I had to boil the message down to, to, to one line and to give you a, 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 a title for this message, I've titled the message tonight, Is was and is to come. We're going to see a sentence in what we read tonight that's written in there two times. We're also going to find out as we study through the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is going to say Jesus is, or Jesus was, is, was, and is to come. And we'll talk about each one of those when we get there tonight. But uh, tonight I want you to understand that before time began, Jesus was. There never was a time when Jesus was not. God did not create Jesus. He always was. Now in the body, in the flesh, He was born, but He existed long before that. Now everybody say amen to that. There never was a time when the Spirit was not here. So before time began, Jesus was there. And in the here and now... Jesus is here, and if that's a help for you, say amen. It is. And in the future, an eternity, right down here in front of us, Jesus will always be. There's never going to be a time when Jesus does not exist. So tonight, we're going to look at ver four verses of Scripture, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And we will quickly make some observations, and then, we'll, and, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about that. So I'm going to kind of talk through the text that I read tonight. I think it kind of lends itself to that. So picking up in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches. Now remember, John is writing what Jesus Christ is saying to him, and over the next three, bird, three chapters, he's going to be giving some information to the churches. And the, the text right there said, the seven churches in Asia. Remember I told you the number seven has great significance in the book of Revelation, and it always talks about the complete. What you really need to think about when you see this, it's not so much that John was just writing this to seven particular churches that he's going to name out. He was writing this to all the churches that would ever exist before Jesus Christ makes his return. Which means John was writing this letter to us. So John, to the seven, to the complete of all the churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace, and you might want to underline this, because this is like a set of parentheses, if you would. Him who is, who was, and is to come. I've got that underlined in my Bible. Him who is, who was, and is to come. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that tonight, so I won't talk about that right here. And from the seven spirits. Now, a lot of questions come back and people come and ask me, who are the seven spirits that are contained in the book of Revelation? I thought there was just one Holy Spirit. And here's the answer to that. There is one Holy Spirit. Well, why does the Bible say seven spirits? Who said, who said what now? It's going to be the complete complexity of the Holy Spirit that he's talking about. There's that seven again. It's not that there's seven distinct spirits that we have there. It's just the whole of who God is in reference to the Spirit. He is here. So, uh, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. Now remember when Jesus came... Jesus never spoke a word that the Father didn't tell him to speak, and Jesus never took an action that the Father didn't tell him to act. 
So he was the faithful witness. He was God stepping out of heaven to be the witness here on earth so we could see what God looked like. And when we look at Jesus, who do we see? We see God the Father. We do, through Jesus, all right? Going on, verse 5, he said, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn among the dead. So when you hear firstborn, well, you're going to think, well, he's the firstborn. He's going to be, there was a time when he was not, therefore he was born. That's not what that's talking about. He says he is the firstborn from what? The dead. Okay, we're going to talk about how Jesus can be the firstborn among the dead. Was Jesus the first person to ever die? Okay, we'll come back to that and answer that a little bit later on. And, the, and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And that's why we call him the king of kings and the lord of lords. Because there is no earthly kingdom that he's not king over that. He has all power over Satan and everything. And he says to him, now this to him, it's got a to him now. If you go down a little further in, in verse 6, it says to him. It's talking about, uh, it's talking about God. To, to, whom, to him who loves us. To the one who loves us and had freed us from our sins. And how did he do it? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? We have been freed from the penalty of our sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have been made to where we can have freedom from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? We don't have to yield to sin anymore because the Spirit of God is in us. He goes on in verse 6 and he says, And He made us a kingdom. So we, this is part of the gift of who He gives us. He created us to be a kingdom which is here now, but it's not completely here. And we're going to talk about that tonight. He also says, We are priests to His God and Father, who is God the Father. To Him be glory and dominion. So who does the glory and the dominion belong to? God the Father. All right, Forever and ever... And then the word amen simply means this is the way it is. That's it. All right? Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. So what we want to see there. By the way, who pierced Jesus? We did, Metaphorically speaking and spiritually speaking, he was pierced for our transgressions. But who literally pierced Jesus? The Roman soldiers did. All right? So we and the Roman soldiers are going to see Jesus Christ when he makes his return to come back. And all the tribes of earth will wail or they will cry on account, they will mourn on account of him. Even so, amen. It's that way. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Greek, the Greek alphabet starts with A, ends with Omega. Says the Lord God, and then here's that second set of parentheses. If you open up the parentheses, you've got to close it back off. It says, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And God's people said. Amen. That's what God says. Okay. All right, that's what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, we've seen a lot of the little phrases there, and we'll come back and talk about those. But I, I want you to, to show you a couple of things real quick in what we just read before I get started real deep is how God feels about you. Number one is He loves you. And that text is reminding us that He loved us, and He loved us so much that He stepped out of heaven, came and made His presence here. He died, He rose from the grave, and He goes sits on, on the, uh, the, the right hand of God the Father so that they are both having action in our lives where we are today. But He also freed us from the penalty of our sins. Our sins, God chooses to remember them no more. So as far as God is concerned, our sins have been dealt with, and they were dealt with on the body of Jesus Christ. And He's put us to be citizens in the kingdom of God, and these are all a blessing that comes from God. And He's also made each individual one of us a priest. So since we are priests, we have instant access to God as though we were in the Old Testament. They had to have a priest who would go in the Holy of Holies and make intercession once a year. But now you and I are connected with God. And those are some of the things. Now, some of the things else that was told in the text right here, we're going to talk about in a minute, is that we're going to see Jesus Christ come back. And when he does, he's going to come back in the clouds. And when he does, 
Every eye is going to see him, and everybody's going to know that that's taking place. And then we're going to remember that he, from that point on, will always be with us. And there'll never be a time when we long to see Jesus because we will see him face to face. So sometimes we need to be reminded, though, that there was a time before we were ever born, and there will be a time after our earthly bodies die, right? Okay? Our todays keep us pretty busy. I don't know about your today, but my todays are always filled with health issues, work issues, bills, relationships, and all those kinds of things. And I am so glad that I can stop and talk to Jesus about those things. By the way, do you pray about paying the bills at your house? Amen. Do you pray about your financial situation? Do you pray about your health with the Lord? You should. These are things that need to come up in the conversations when you talk to God about those things. You pray about relationships that you have with people in business or you have relationships that we have with people in your life. You should because it does matter. Okay. Now, moving on, what I want to do is uh, look at a phrase that we see in the text, and we see it in there twice. It's the one that says, Him who is, who was, and is to come. So the first thing I want to talk about tonight is the one who was. So would everybody say, please say, the one who was. Okay, there's, there's a couple of things I want to talk about the one who was. God created humanity. He stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing. He created everything. He did that long before time began. Uh, he, he had decided to do that long before time began. The Trinity existed always with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And one thing we need to completely understand is God is wholly self-sufficient within Himself and He has no needs whatsoever. Did y'all hear what I said? God does not need for us to love Him. By the way, do you need somebody to love you? You do. You do. And God loves you, but you also need humans that are going to love you. You have emotional needs. You have physical needs. But there's never a need that exists that God needs. So He did not create people. He did not create the universe because He needed something to do. He did not create people as individuals so that He would have somebody to fellowship with. He simply did it just because he wanted to, all right? And that's kind of hard for us to wrap our brains about this. Um, the, the triune God was fully complete, yet they in themselves chose to create beings to share in the glory of God. And this being we call humanity. Now remember, we exist to glorify God. If anybody ever asks you why in the world you exist, you exist to glorify God by reflecting the glory of God. And the best way you reflect the glory of God is not by getting everything right in your life. I know that's what everybody thinks. If we just get everything right, we'll paint a better picture of who God is. And really the opposite is true of that. We talked about the glory of God this morning for a few minutes. And I had a screen that went up on the overhead that talked about what the glory of God was. Does anybody remember any of the words that were contained up there? Just shout one out if you remember one. Grace, mercy, love, faithfulness, justice, you know, uh, and these things. You see, when we let other people see how God has extended His grace to us, and by the way, how often does God extend grace to you? Every day. How often does He not give you what you really do deserve? That mercy on a regular basis. You know what the Bible says? His mercies are new. How often? Every morning. They're brand new. Okay? So this is blessings that come from God. So God created this fallen situation so that it would be an opportunity for His glory to shine among the creation that He created so that we could see that. And that's why in the book of Revelation we're going to see our sinfulness, and we're going to see the glory of God, and we're going to see how God overcomes the sinfulness that's in us and overcomes the sinfulness of the devil and, the, and the, all this rebelled against him. So he creates the man, but before he created the man, the, second thing, or the first thing he actually did was create the universe. He created the heavenly host. He created all the angels. He created the angels that rebelled. He, he created all that, that that makes up any kind of being whatsoever. God created the heavenly host, the universe, before he created humanity. And the Trinity's wisdom, 
He created a universe where evil would be allowed to creep in. Now, God didn't create the evil, but when He created it, He left a way for it to wiggle itself in. And when He had created Satan, He knew exactly what Satan would do with that which, which He had created him with, so that evil could be kicked off and launched. And evil, uh, Satan begot to be really good at it before man was ever placed in the Garden of Eden. So when he has his first conversation with Eve, he's able to tempt her in just the right way that she yields to that temptation and lets sin enter into your life. Just, that's the original sin that took place and it still has an effect on each one of us today. This was done so that humanity would be able to see their need for the Creator. Now a lot of people seem to think you get saved and then that's it. You get right with God, you get saved and that's where... They're, they're missing what salvation is all about. Salvation is all about God being with us even when He is not physically here with us. He is still here with us through the Spirit that indwells us. So He created the universe, He created humanity and the Creator does an amazing thing. The Creator Himself becomes a part of the creation. So this is what was before us. No, not before humanity, but before us, God takes on the form of a man. God overshadows uh, the body of Mary. Mary conceives, she gives birth to a son who is God of the universe here in present, right here. And after, uh, after man's mankind's creation, but before you and me, the Creator stepped out of glory and He became a part of the creation. He did this to provide a way of escape from the guilt of the sin, which is what that text was talking about when it reminds us we've been, that our sin has been dealt with by the blood of Jesus Christ. All humans have evil hearts. If... If you ever get mad at yourself because you think evil things about people at some time and you think, oh my, my, I'm the worst person in the world because I think this, I want you to know something. Everybody sitting next to you has thought evil thoughts about somebody at some point in time. People just do that because of the way we, we are. All humans have evil thoughts and Jesus died to be able to bring the new covenant. We talked to many of you studying Jeremiah. You talked about the new covenant today. We talk, he, did, he died so that the new covenant could lead us to come to a recreated heart that's made new in a new way. And all of this was done. The one who was. But not only have the one who was, let's think about for a minute the one who is. Now, it's the same one. It's God. But it makes difference in the is that we have right here. So him who is, he's actively involved in every situation that you face in your day. You think about that? There's never a moment when you have to tell God what's going on around you. It's good for you to tell God what's going on around you because it helps you articulate and you can see better the things that are happening around you. But you're praying that not so that God will have the information but so that you'll be able to see it from God's perspective on this thing. All right, so he, he, he's actively involved. Jesus is actively involved in our daily activities, and he knows our every need, and he is, the, he is in the process of working history out according to his plan. He already knows how it turns out, so he knows today that which needs to be done so that it'll turn out the way that it turns out. Now, how many of y'all know how everything's going to turn out in 2027? <laughs> Nobody does, okay? You don't even know, you're not for sure that you're going to make it back to your house and crawl in your bed tonight, right? I mean, there's so many unknowns that we have, yet God knows that and He's actively involved in the things that He's allowing to happen or the things He's causing to happen today have something to do with that which is in our future. And we're not able to see it, know it, or understand it. But He's actively involved in the middle of all of that. Right now, Jesus is sanctifying you and I. He's providing for you and He's guiding us in the way that we should go. So we want to do what Jeremiah says. We want to listen so that we can hear the Spirit of God say to us, this is the way. Walk in it. I'm glad y'all read the same book I do. Okay? Now Jesus is actively involved, but He's also keenly aware. He's not just aware of what's going on in your life. He is keenly aware of what things are going to make 
uh, eternal differences and what things are going to make monthly differences, what things are going to make a difference 25 years from now, what things are going to don't really make a whole lot of difference about tomorrow. Jesus is clean, keenly aware of these things, and I want you to note the way that John describes this to us. He says he is the Alpha and the Omega. I told you a while ago that that is Alpha is the first letter of the Greek language and Omega is the last letter. John is not saying that God can only work through the Greek language with A and Z. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is God knows the whole, the whole alphabet. And if you know all, well, let's just use English, for example. Um, in English, we got A to Z. Is that 26 letters or is it, is it 24? I forgot how many it was. That's because I used to think LMNOP was one letter. That's what was giving me trouble. All right, that song gave me fits for years. But anyway, I mean, every letter in the alphabet works together to form every word in our language. How many words are there in the English language? Does anybody even have a clue? I'm sure somebody knows technically what that word is, but then we got all the derivatives from that. What John is saying is in the Greek language in which he's writing this particular letter from right here, he's saying from the very, you take the, the, the alpha, you take the omega, and you take every letter that's in between there, God has control over every one of those letters, and he is keenly aware and can use those words to explain to you what it is you need to know is God is working things out in your life. So what you do is you pray to God and you go back to the words of Scripture. You go back to the Bible. You read it every day. And God soothes your mind and your heart to let you know that you're going to be okay. And God's not going, ah, I just didn't see this coming. God's saying, I was. And since I was, and since I will be, I know what matters in today. And I won't let anything happen that doesn't need to happen for his glory and for our good, which he says in the book of Romans. And he's making sure, making sure every letter that's used in the alphabet to make every word, he's making sure everything lines up with the words that are in the 66 books of the Bible. Okay, So he is keenly aware, he's actively involved, and he also is the king of the kingdom of God. Now, there's going to be a time, Jesus, God has put Jesus in control of everything. When everything is all said and done, Jesus brings everything into order like it should be, and he takes it back and he lays it back down at the feet of his Father. We'll see that later on in, in Revelation, later on. But for right now, he's working everything out just like it needs to be. The kingdom of God is partially here, and it's not yet here. Now, this will drive you crazy when you're reading the Gospels. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke... You will keep hearing, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is here. Oh, by the way, the God of this world is Satan. And then you hear all these, and there seems to be some kind of tug of war. And it's like the, the disciples are constantly asking Jesus, when you come back, when this happens, when this happens, is this when you're going to set your kingdom up? And Jesus is saying to them, the kingdom of God is here. And then he turns around and he says, well, the kingdom of God is coming. So which is it? Is the kingdom here or is the kingdom coming? And the answer to the question is yes. Now the difference is, it's partially here now. But the laws, the regulations, the things that are going to be, are not fully implemented here yet. So God sent Jesus down here to set up the kingdom, that set up the foundation of the kingdom, which is here now, but the fulfillment of that whole kingdom is not yet here. So the theologians came up with a complicated word. They say that's the theory of the now, not yet. Now, doesn't sound good. The kingdom's here, but it's not yet here, and we're caught in between the middle of that, but God is still in control. The kingdom of God is partially here, but not fully here yet. Satan is the prince of the world, and he's under the sway of God. So he can do all kinds of stuff, but he has to get approval from God to do what it is he does. You remember when he came to Job and he wanted to mess with Job and God said you can mess with him, but you can't touch his body? And then after he wouldn't renounce God then, Job goes back and says, well, it's only because you wouldn't let him renounce his body. And God says, okay, we'll go ahead and mess with his body. You'll find out the same thing. And, and, so he had to get God's approval to be able to do it. Even Satan today, when he does anything, if it's going to affect a human, if it's going to affect a Christian person, he has to get the authority from God to be able to do that. And that's what's happening day and night. And that's why Revelation at one point says he was accusing them day and night 
Because he, he, he accuses uh, you before God on a regular basis today. But it doesn't, it doesn't surprise God because he's laid the foundation of the kingdom and the full kingdom is coming later. So in this time between when the lamb, Jesus Christ, died on the cross and when the lion from the tribe of Judah makes his return when he comes back, Satan attempts to thwart the purposes of God but it's always unsuccessful. Um, because he is not equal to God, all things move in the direction that God wants them to move. He, Satan wins battles, but he never wins the victories. Of, he never wins the victory of the overall campaign. They, 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 these battles that we fight, when there's tug and pull between the two kingdoms that are at work, actually glorify God the Father and the Son rules over the kingdom in the end we see that God had purpose. All the stuff that you're going through, all the stuff that your family is going through, there's purpose in it. And you can't be who you're supposed to be without going through that. And the kingdom of God can't be the kingdom it's supposed to be until we go through the junk that is in our life. And the junk is in our life, not because God makes us have junk in our life. The junk is in our life because sin has been set free in the world. But yet God, in the who will be, who's coming, that's when he makes all that stuff right and he brings it together. So that's what brings us to, instead of talking about the God who was and the God who uh, will be, he is the God who is to come. Now, this is stuff that's going to be in the future. This is what's in front of us. So what's in front of us? The number one thing that's in front of us is the return of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus died, and he was the firstborn among the dead. I mean, as I talk about this, let me remind you, has anybody in the Bible come back to life? Who can y'all think of? Lazarus, number one. Anybody else? Which widow's son? The widow of Zarephath or the widow that Elijah had dealt less stayed with? Yes. Okay, so there's three right there. All right, can y'all think Lazarus? So that makes four. Any more you can think of? The one, Eutychus, the one that fell out of the window and died, and Paul raised him from the dead. So that's five. Jairus' daughter, he raised. There you go. There's another one. There's, the, there's another widow in the New Testament that was in a funeral possession. It's the widow of none, and Jesus comes along, lays his hand up on top of the casket, and what happens? He rises from the grave. I, I think, if I'm right, I think there are seven times in Scripture where, well, even, even I don't know if y'all ever caught this or not, when you're reading through the book of 2 Kings, you'll find out after Elijah's dead and gone, Elijah's bones get moved and they get thrown <laughs> into a cave, and those bones land on somebody else's bones that are in there, and those bones come to life. So we got all of these resurrections. But all of those people who are resurrection have one thing in common. They died again. They died a second death. But now Jesus Christ, when he rose from the grave, he did not die again. And the reason for that is he has given us victory over death. Death has been defeated. Right? We cannot die. Our bodies can die but our eternal spirit will always be in the presence of God and will always have some kind of body to put that spirit in there. Je uh, Jesus died and was the firstborn among that, but Jesus is the only one who was raised to absolute eternal to an eternal state. When he returns, every eye is going to see him and and every family and every nation is going to mourn. Now, I don't know um, of the of the tech, I don't know of any technology that exists right now that'll make you see that when it happens. Now, I know that almost every household in America has a television set, and I know that bunches of households in, uh, in, in, in America, people have telephones, and if you want to watch a football game where you're somewhere else, you can watch a live football game that's going on right there. But I don't think God's going to use any of that technology. I think when Jesus Christ comes back, there's going to be a flash in the sky so bright that it just about blinds everybody. It's going to be the glory of God, that, like that Shekinah glory that was in the Old Testament. And over the entire face of the earth, everyone is going to see that 
at one time. I don't, you know, I don't know of any technology to do that, but God is the omnipotent, all-powerful God who causes the world to, uh, to, to spin, and he'll also be the one who stops everything right at that moment. And he's going to descend from heaven, and it'll be just like Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So what I want to do tonight is remind you what that's going to look like. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. You can look it up if you want to, but let me say this. What we read here is not, a, is not the rapture of the church seven years before a tribulation. Okay? Because it says in that text, and I'll show you in the text where it says it, it talks about the new bodies. All right? And it talks about those things that are, that are happening. But we, l- l- listen to me as I read. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Now, who are the ones who are asleep? Those are the ones who have died in Christ that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, the ones who have no hope are the ones who didn't have Christians who died. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. All right? So now, what I want you to get right now is what this is talking about is when the resurrection and the people come up out of the grave. Now, what you've heard about the pre-tribulation rapture would be the church is raptured up and taken on. But now, this is, this is the, the people who are in the graves. The bodies are being caught up into that. For we declare to you by the word of the Lord that we are all alive. We who, li- who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend with heaven with the, crowd, with the cry of a command and with the voice of an angel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. And why does Paul give us that information? He tells us in the last verse. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now everybody say amen. Because what that means is every saint that you've known before you that's died, they're going to be raised from the grave and they're going to see Jesus Christ. But not only are they going to see Jesus Christ, you're going to see them too. Because you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. This is the second coming of Christ. Now if you hold to a pre-tribulation rapture, I'm not going to preach, I'm never going to preach the, the rapture and, and the way things unfold in this, but if you do, that is not the rapturing of the church. This is when Jesus Christ makes his return, which would be called in that, if you had that model, it would be called the second coming of Christ. Okay? But Jesus Christ is coming back. And when he does, there's going to be mourning. But now uh, Mourning. Now, why are we going to mourn? Why does the scripture, why does the text we read a while ago talk about mourning? The thing about Christians is, is when they come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they slip and fall, and they have sin in their lives, does that make you feel good? Or does it make you mourn because you let God down or because you've got sin crept up in your life? Think about for just a moment, when you first see Jesus Christ making his return, You're probably, God has chosen to remember your sins no more. How good are you at forgetting your sins? In fact, the worse the sin is, are you more prone to forget it quicker or slower? You see, we'll be reminded of that. We'll mourn because when we see Jesus come back in that body with the nail prints on his hands and we see the crown of thorn prints on his head, we're going, to be, we're going to remember that it was our sin that put that on him. And that's the thought we have. But now on the flip side of that, those who are alive and see him when Jesus Christ returns, they're going to be given a resurrection as well. Everybody is resurrected from the grave. Now I, pr- I propose to you, based on what I read in Revelation, that there are going to be two separate resurrections. The first resurrection will be the resurrection of those who knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The second resurrection will be the ones who did not know Jesus Christ. And they will be resurrected. And then what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 
that the perishable must put on imperishability. In other words, that which could be consumed can no longer be consumed, so the lost person will have a brand new body that will not wear out. We will have a body in heaven that will not wear out. But when we're, we're walking in heaven, we're walking in paradise. But when people who are lost rise to, from the grave, where will they be? In hell, and be full blown hell then. Not just, they're going to be right there in hell, and in hell they will burn. But guess what? That new body will not be consumed. That's how someone can be burned and continue to stay there because that's the kind of body that he recreates. So, also, everyone will mourn the followers of Jesus and the lost. The followers of Jesus will mourn when they come to repentance, but the lost, the Holy Spirit, they are able to see themselves and their sins and they're able to see Jesus, their Savior. The lost will mourn when they bow down in hell and worship Jesus. But then, after that, Jesus Christ comes back. Now, is there a thousand year millennial in there? Are we in the millennial now? And I want you to give you my, my theological opinion on that. I'm not sure. I can, I can read scripture and I can see a dispensationalist view and I can see why people hold to that. I can see the amillennialist view and I can see why people hold to that. I can see the historical uh, premillennial view and I can hold to that. I can see and I can put into scripture things that would make that work. But I'm not sure any of them's got it all right. But I am sure that God said that Jesus Christ said while he was on earth, no man shall know the day or hour when Jesus Christ comes back. If you want to know why God made it foggy and unclear, is because the revealed things belong to us. But the unrevealed things belong to who? God. We're all, it's a need to know kind of thing. And the real fact of the matter is, we don't need to know. We need to just trust in Jesus. So when Jesus Christ returned, the, 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 the question comes, well, now here, here's one more fact I want to give you. When you look in the Bible, you will see that phrase. He, let me see, how does he say it in here? Him who is, who, who was, and he who is to come. When you get to chapter 11, in chapter 11 in the book of Revelation, you will say that it no longer says uh, he who is and who was and is to come. It simply says, he who is and he who was. Anybody want to take a guess why it doesn't say he who is to come? Because in chapter 11, verse 17, he's here. He's there. He's come. That's the way it is. Now, some of the translators back in the old days when they were translating the King James, they saw that that was missing, so they put it back in there. The translator thought it was in there. But he didn't, re he didn't realize that they weren't repeating the phrase in chapter 11. You see where Jesus Christ has come back. So, they were, so many of your modern translations won't hold that. Some of your other translations have parentheses around that, and some will uh, still have them in there. But the fact, the fact of the matter is this. God was, He is, and He is to come to us. He was, and He is, and He will come. But when He comes, He was... He is, and He, and it is, because He can't be anything but is, because we're in the is where He is. Did y'all get that? I think you did. Can you repeat that? <laughs> no, I cannot repeat that. Okay, but you got it. You know what I'm talking about. Where He is, there will we will be also. And when we are there, it's going to be so much. It's going to be so great to just see Jesus face to face. You know. There's hints of that in Scripture when that time comes. And one of my favorite hints is found in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, Faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is... Love. Now, why is love greater than faith and hope? Hope is realized when Jesus Christ comes back. And there's no longer any faith needed because Jesus is here, and you don't have to have faith that He exists... Because you can see him and he's here. That's just a reality. Though faith and hope disappear, but love lasts for all of eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. Lord God in heaven, thank you for your word.